today of introducing our facilitator and leader for this session, um, Michael Feldstein. He is the Chief Accountability Officer at eLiterate. Previously, he has been a partner at MindWires Consulting, Senior Program Manager at MindTap at Cengage Learning, and Principal Product Strategy Manager for Academic Enterprise Solutions, formerly Academic Enterprise Initiative, or AEI, at Oracle Corporation. Prior to that, Michael was an Assistant Director at the SUNY Learning Network, where he oversaw blended learning faculty development and was part of the leadership team for the LMS platform migration efforts of this 40 campus program. Michael is a past member of the Sakai Foundation Board and took part in the effort to merge the foundation with JSIG to form Perio. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Jolie. It's great to be here. So I guess I am kicking it off, apparently. Um, it's good to see you all here. Um, it's good to see a good sized crowd. Um, it's good to sort of see you in this new world that we're in. Um, who knew we would learn to uh, be experts at Zoom uh, uh, conferencing and networking. I don't know that I can claim the title of expert yet. We're about to find out actually, because we're not assuming that you all saw the discussion prompt. Um, so uh, I am going to uh, jump in and, and try to show you the video discussion prompt. And assuming that goes well and nothing crashes and burns, then uh, uh, Jolie and Lucy Appert uh, and I will uh, start a little conversation with you to get us kicked off for the afternoon. So let's see if I can. Uh, Okay. Uh, so, are you seeing my YouTube video page now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, here we go. Hi, I'm Michael Feldstein from eLiterate, and I want to talk to you today about how we can rebuild and revitalize education together. And don't worry, this isn't a pitch for a new religion or a self-actualization course or an ed tech product that can semi-read your mind. I'm talking about hard work, employing realistic strategies together over time. I'm talking about organizing a movement, and I call this movement the Resilience Network. In recent days, we've experienced a series of crises that have exposed how fragile and flawed our institutions are. Uh, how fragile and flawed our way of life is, really. Somehow, we have to find a way to respond to this rolling series of existential crises we're going through and still find the energy and the focus and the capacity for collective action that will enable us to reimagine our education system and to rebuild it stronger. It, it's overwhelming. Uh, but as the saying goes, uh, there's no way out but through. I don't exactly know what the right answer looks like, but I do know what the wrong one looks like. It looks like what we're doing now. Half of us are out there killing ourselves, sometimes literally, to try to keep the ship from sinking. And the other half of us are climbing the walls with frustration and writing passionate tweets because we don't know what else we can do. People are frantically throwing links to stuff they're producing into a Google Sheet in the hopes that somebody else who needs it might find it. This won't work. We're treading water at best. We need to coordinate better, organize our bucket brigades, learn from these crises while we're going through them, and make sure we don't lose the lessons that we're learning. This isn't going to be easy or pretty, but like just about everything else that matters, it starts with a conversation. This video is meant to be a discussion prompt for your group. You may have noticed that I'm not naming that group. That's because I want this to be a prompt for many different groups. 
we should all be asking ourselves the same questions about how we can help and what we can do differently. And if we're doing it right, we'll come up with a variety of different answers. Particularly in the early days, the Resilience Network movement will work partly like a hashtag and partly like a potluck dinner. It's partly like a hashtag in the sense that we're all working to make the resources that we're creating more discoverable, focused on a particular intention. We want to make our institutions more resilient. We share a common purpose. We're learning how to do this as we go. People are already doing a lot of sharing, but we need to get better at effective sharing. If we start labeling efforts as part of the resilience network, or hashtag resilience network, then we can lower the cost of knowledge gathering. In the digital age, sharing information is easy and cheap, and that's part of the problem. With all of the production that's happening at an astonishing rate, which is adding to the enormous amount of existing information that is kind of sort of fit for purpose and was already out on the internet, people who are in a crisis don't have the time to spend hours Googling for something useful. We have to make sure that the right resources are available at their fingertips. At this point, I'm going to start weaving another analogy into this story. Think about what we've already learned from the medical supply chain during the COVID crisis. Patients who need ventilators can't get them because they're sitting broken in a warehouse. Doctors who have test kits can't use them because they've run out of cotton swabs. Cotton swabs. Part of what we're trying to do here is crowdsource a supply chain. And that supply chain doesn't work unless we all get the right tools and information directly to our frontline responders at their moment of need. This is emergency room stuff. There's no time to waste. So the idea of a hashtag, which I mean both literally and metaphorically, is that we're trying to organize the resources we have and get them to those emergency room personnel. We don't have the luxury of a centralized, organized supply chain. So we're using the crowdsourcing tools that we have. Now, if we can get the resources we have to the point of need, that's great. But what if we don't have the resources that they need? What if there aren't enough cotton swabs to go around? One of the things that a supply chain does is coordinate the production of needed resources. So we have to duplicate that function too. This brings us to the potluck analogy. When we organize a potluck dinner, we start by sharing what everybody would like to contribute, but we don't stop there. If three people are bringing desserts and nobody is bringing a salad, we talk about that. And hopefully somebody steps up and makes a salad. It's not a perfect method. If most of our friends are lousy cooks, then we might have a problem. A potluck is not the same as a catered meal. But we can do it together with the resources we have. And in our case, we happen to have a lot of cooks. Some are better than others. But we have a large and enthusiastic group of friends who want to contribute. Some of this is about making sure that we're utilizing the human resources that right now are sitting on their hands or tweeting in frustration. So this is what we have to do together. I told you this video is intended to be a discussion prompt. So here come the questions. Here are the challenges I'm asking you to discuss with your group. First, what resources can you offer that might be useful to someone during a resilience crisis like this one? I'm being deliberately vague by what I mean by a resource. It might be content or a tool or an offer of help or something else. Probably something I haven't thought of. Think about what you already have and how close it is to being immediately fit for purpose. Think about what you can create and what you can offer. Second, how can you help the network to categorize those resources so that we can route them to the right people? Math instructors and English instructors need different things. 
instructors need different things than instructional designers. Instructional designers and deans, different things. Think about what you can do to help us do together to organize those resources so that people can find what they need. Third, how can you help the network check the quality of resources that we're sharing? A document telling everybody to drink a shot of bleach for their health is not helpful. A lot of instructional resources are produced by people with good intentions but weaker skills. Think about how you can help the network to address this problem together in a distributed way. And finally, how can you help the network get the right resources directly to the point of need? A ventilator that has made it from the warehouse to the basement of the hospital still isn't useful until it's moved into the emergency room and in the hands of a trained practitioner. And the patient may not have time for somebody to wheel it up or for the practitioner to be trained. Think about how you can help the network to get the appropriate resources to the point of use at the moment of need. These are the questions that I want your group to discuss and brainstorm. Don't spend too much time debating definitions or weeding out bad ideas. For now, just let it rip. Go crazy. We need to think big. Once you have all your ideas on the table, then you can decide as a group which are the best ones for you to act on. Because remember, the goal here is for us to act. So those are your questions. There's your assignment. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Okay, so I saw a lot of good conversation going on in the chat group, some of which made me hungry. Um, I just want to I want to make a couple of very quick points, and then I, I want to bring uh, Jolie and and Lucy into the conversation. Um, this is an open source community, so there are a couple of things that you're really good at, right? You're you're good at working together in a distributed fashion to identify needs and match those needs with resources. Right, so there are certain skills that you have. A lot of folks I talk to on campuses are struggling right now with the fact that they're working remotely. They're used to being in the same room with their collaborators. You know some things about doing work together in this kind of an environment. Uh, um, and the second is um, some of the things that you know about, some is process and some is tools. Right, and I think we need to be thinking about both. The, the questions that have come up and the needs that have been surfaced are, are very specific, very niche -y. They might be very um, time sensitive and they may or may not be ephemeral, right? Our needs are gonna change over time. So we need to get really good at doing this and keeping this up. This can't be something that we do to the point of exhaustion and dropping because guess what? It, this isn't going to stop after the fall semester. The, the financial crisis is coming after this one and the reimagining what the university is going to look like to be sustainable is going to come after this and so on. So with that, let me open it up to Jolie and, and Lucy. I know you've been uh, watching the chat and uh, participating and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to frame this conversation which of course we're ultimately aiming at producing some useful ideas for the Apirio con community to, to step up with and, and contribute to the larger effort. So um, Michael, what struck me from watching your video and then some things I've seen in the chat um, are probably we need more voices. Uh, we need thicker voices contributing to this. One of the things that I've, I've observed to you and to Jolie is that I feel like a lot of the resources that are being produced right now are design resources that, um, that uh, yes, thicker voices, Laura, in that we're producing these design resources that are stitching together the technical 
and the application. Um, and um, and th there's probably an endless number of these resources, but one of the things that struck me um, as Michael was talking is that one of the things that everyone thought we needed were ventilators. And in fact, it turned out that we needed dialysis machines just as much as ventilators, but no one was prepared for that. And so I feel like there's expertise in this group of people, and this is what I mean by a thicker set of voices, that can say, what are we not looking for right now? What are we, um, in our knowledge of, we, a lot of people in this room know a lot about scale, they know a lot about findability, they know a lot about what happens when the pilots um, try to hit the implementations, and so what are we, um, what can we, in, in our experience um, with working in open source and software development and an application, what are we missing here? What's the dialysis machine that we're going to have to use on four patients because we have 15 ventilators? Um, we forgot about that piece. So that's how I, I would frame just now as our preparation. We're going to have some campus leaders come in a few minutes and talk about what they're seeing from 30,000 feet. But I think it'd be great to get a quick go around of, of um, collecting from people. Um, put in the chat, um, raise your hand metaphorically or, or in real life or start talking. What are, where do we need to be looking? Let's add that, that we do have that discussion thread um, that is in the Sakai instance and that is asynchronous. So if you don't, if you're thinking about this and it is a big topic to think about, if you are thinking about it and you wanna put it someplace that persists um, and you're not ready with an answer or on the tip of your tongue, that's okay. Put it in the discussion thread. I will also say, I, I agree with what Lucy said. Now, you know, as much as I was, we had a chat previous to this, to this session where we talked about how institutionally we think about our uniqueness. And now is really an opportunity to think about how we're the same and how we can share. And I've really been heartened by the fact that I've seen our institution adopt something that was Creative Commons license to get started with our Keep Teaching site and that we've continued to use the Creative Commons license. Now is the time since we're you know, building all this content to kind of bring that into practice. I think it's something we've talked about. We've wanted to do it as, a, as, a, as an institution at Duke. Specifically, we talk about how we want to share and that we're open. But, you know, it's not systemic yet, right? Um, and now we're in this, this big initiative um, to create content and create resources. And so it is an opportunity as, as much as we're um, really um, busy creating that content and doing that work, it is an opportunity to think about that and put that into practice. Yeah, it's a great point, and I'm I'm see I'm seeing a lot of uh, remarks come in over the chat. Um, I'll just start with one that, um, and we'll go backward. That um, Stephen Markard says our team invested a lot of effort in creating localized resources, quite specific to our context, but felt like we didn't have time to coordinate or collaborate with other universities, even though we CC licensed everything we did. Same, we shared the ours mm -hmm. widely within our institution. Um, you know, and so we have a kind of uniform institutional look and feel, um, but we didn't think about who would take those. Out. Yeah. Um, Aria Chernick, who we'll hear about, hear from a lot more at around 2.30, says we need student voices. Um, and I'm interested to hear about where students have come in to the calculations in other places. Generally, it's like, will they come back? Um, or did they like it? Um, but not, uh, or they're not afraid of dying, but um, not, um, not really anything about um, uh, substantive about, um, you know, kind of what they're getting from this or anything. So I'm wondering if any institutions did anything that could be um, surveys or ways of bringing students in that could be helpful. 
Yeah, uh, they can be brought in. Um, most of us are residential campuses and we're looking for changing traffic patterns. We're looking for changing dining room schedules, the logistics of keeping people apart from each other while having spaces that they can at least be six feet apart, no further, no closer. Students have a say in all of those, but we're not we're not consulting them. They're the ones who are going to have to walk the paths that we design and they're going to have to eat at the times that that we designate um, and decide whether, you know, sack lunches are the thing of the future or so many changes to each and every campus that as someone said earlier, these are not unique. They're things that every uh, every residential structure is having to think about for whoever does choose to come back, and we hope that they do. You know, Laura, what you were saying, I think, is um, connected to a comment from Harold Hale in the, in the chat, which is system integration is what we're not thinking about. How do you make the pieces and parts talk to each other with the realization that everyone has slightly different pieces and parts? This is a piece that makes me very nervous for fall. Um, it, it, or, um, are we thinking about those flow patterns? Um, I think it's kind of like every, for us, every department thinking about their own situation. And, and we've always had that problem of faculty members imagining their class is the only one students have, right? But if you imagine this on a, a larger scale, I think, yeah, it's a good point. Another thing I'd like to propose if we ever do get to breakout rooms is, uh, is having an online <laughs> an online course on how to teach online under the assumption that if we took a poll of our faculty, many of them have never been students in an online course before. They don't know what things they would find off-putting, what things they would like to model. If we could model excellence in teaching online to faculty as students. It, and that's something I bet every single one of our institutions would benefit from, but instead of collaborating to pull something like that off, which takes a lot of hours, uh, we, we tend to either um, do something quick and dirty and say, no, we can't do that. We'll do uh, personalized consultations or, or something like that instead of just digging down and saying, this would be awesome. So I'm seeing a couple of people. I know that Terry Golightly mentioned this in the chat. Um, I'm seeing that Tasneem is also saying this. I will say that um, our my office is running an online mini course, and the only point of that course is to understand what it's like to be a student in an online course. Um, that's the whole goal of it, is to experience being moved back and forth. Um, and it looks like Tasneem um, actually just created a four a four-week course on this. And I saw that um, maybe Natalina added some links uh, from Pepperdine that this is something that you you all had done as well. And that does seem, as Laura is suggesting, this um, train, this sense of training and kind of what are the basics to cover in a training and how you do that. That seems like the kind of design document that would be worthwhile, a checklist or something for that where you could do your own branding of it or your own particular institutional spin, but just to have that, make sure everybody includes this, right? Because we do have standards for online courses. We do have things that we could incorporate. I think one of the problems that keeps coming up, which both um, learning designers and software designers are familiar with, is the balance between a goal of reusability um and a goal of ease of use right so we make things more reusable by taking away context connections right and what you really want when you create a something for a first-time faculty member is to say here click here on this button that i know is here because i put it here in our particular installation of our lms and then this will happen and then you do these things and there may be some design elements in there, but they're woven in with the implementation so the faculty member doesn't have to translate and the same thing with the student or anybody else. But that's not very reusable, right? So we have to kind of make some educated guesses about what resources are going to be reusable and how we strike that balance with everything that we create. And that includes courses about 
teaching online, which are going to have some transferable uh, skills, regardless of, you know, the details of implementation and some that aren't. I've seen some great resources. We will grab the chat from this. People are sharing some great resources in the chat. Um, really good. And I see that a point that Tiffany Stahl made. Yeah, I think I think this idea of a of a master set of resources is also helpful in that um, she Tiffany says a question of how can we model best practices that often get left by the wayside, like creating accessible content. Um, and you know, I think that that's I think that's true that all, that if you have a master set that models the, the things that often get pushed to the, pushed to the side of like, oh, and we also, you know, now every school at NYU has got its own toolkit for making online courses. And then we have the Office of Digital, the Office of Global Inclusion, which has created like the inclusivity toolkit, which is, and that's the surest way that this piece is gonna get left behind because it's also a little add-on that goes beside every other kit. So how do we build these resources that also incorporate all of these materials together? Good point, Tiffany. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the problem because we all have siloed things even within our institutions, right? Um, so even the concept of teaching, we have some kind of center that works on that. And then we have some tech support and then we have some accessibility support. And then we, you know, it's a matter of getting all of the collaborators into one place. And it's, it can be very difficult to get all these siloed um, groups that know their own thing very well, but, you know, all of those things have to work together. And, um, and the instructors may not know about all of those things, but how can we possibly integrate them into a single conversation and make sure it's all taken into account at the same time while we're all being overwhelmed with all of this stuff? <laughs> well, let me throw down a challenge for you on that because this is something I've, I've thought about a lot. I've been talking to all of the big three cloud providers and making some progress, but I think they all would prefer to work with me in concert with one of your institutions um, to say, look, we have these links. Everybody keeps throwing them into the chat room, right? All these links of great resources, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to have time to go through them all. I believe you that they're great. Um, but if we had a crawler, that could go out and say, okay, this, these resources all look like instructions on how to use Zoom. And these resources all look like have instructions on how to flip your classroom, right? Then, and you could do that, you could scope that inter-institutionally. You might even do it intra-institutionally, just so you know what's in your own institution after you have that taxonomy. And then you bring in your, your group and you say, all right, well, we've got this stuff. Now we can start looking at what we have. We've got it collected and we can start going through and we can stop looking at those 40 links because they're behind some logins. So we don't even have to click them. And these 13 over here are from institutions that look like ours. So why don't we dig in over here? That looks like what we need, right? So there, there's, there, it's possible to build tools that can help with this sort of thing. So I just wanted to jump in and say it's 2.30. It's about right. time to shift to our panel. I think we might still be waiting for Ben Maddox to join, right, Lucy? Okay. Yeah, still waiting. Okay, but He's I just want to get back meetings. Okay, um, just want to give a heads up because I know Aria is here and Matthew is here and we want people to know that, yes, we're about to switch to a panel and yes, panelists, you are in the right place. We decided to use one Zoom room for all the afternoon sessions today um, to kind of keep things continuous and keep the conversation going. And Ben, and Ben is here. Yay, great. Excellent. Great. So, all right, do we, sorry, I'm go ahead. I'm at an NYU building today, so if someone comes in, I have to put my mask back on, but I'm in a private space now. I'm far more than six feet away from people, but if that changes, I'll let you know, but Michael, if you hear me muffled through a mask, you'll know I'm just being compliant. 
Well, we want you to be safe. So it's all good. Well, I'll be taking notes for fall and understanding audio capabilities with masks and Zoom, and we'll be grateful for the <laughs> <laughs> be grateful yes, for indeed. that opportunity. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, did we have an introductory slide? I think we did. Um, who's got that handy? I, I had it handy, and now I have too many tabs. Um, Jolie or, 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 uh, um, Lucy, do you happen to have that handy? I've, I've seemed to have lost it. <laughs> I'm not sure that we need it, but um, there we go. I had it up, Michael. I don't know if you could see it. Okay. Uh, well, okay. Sorry. So I'll go transition. Back and put it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Designing for resilience. We have an all-star panel today. Um, can you advance the slide forward, please? Um, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, here we go. So you all have been hearing from me, unless you just joined, I'm Michael Feldstein, the Chief Accountability Officer at eLiterate. Um, delighted to be joined by uh, Aria Chernick, Associate Professor of Practice and Education and in, in education innovation at Duke University. She's also going to be telling us about some uh, a, a great open source uh, pedagogy initiative that she's been working on at Duke. Um, ben Maddox, Associate Vice President of Teaching Learning Technologies and Chief Instructional Technology Officer at New York University. And Matthew Raskoff, Associate Vice Provost for Digital Education Innovation, also at Duke University. So it's an all-star panel today. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more slides on this? I just want to make sure. Right. So the four questions that we teed up in the last half hour, if you were here, or um, also that we teed up in the last half hour, if you weren't here, um, we're trying to figure out how we respond to this crisis at scale, right? And um, the end goal here is for the Imperio community to be thinking about how you all can be working together to contribute to this to a sector-wide effort. What can we do together, right? So what can resources can you offer that might be useful to someone during a resilience crisis? That seems to be the easy one, at least on the surface. People have been throwing out links and that's fantastic. Um, some of those links turn out to be behind logins, which is less fantastic. Some of those links are very institution specific, which are interesting and helpful to a certain degree, but right, there are challenges. Um, uh, how can you help the network categorize those resources so we can route them to the right people? So that's partly the problem I just described. Plus, you know, if you, I'm a math professor, I want stuff that's going to help me teach math online. I'm not interested in stuff that's going to help me teach English online. Um, if I'm an instructional designer, I'm going to want something else. Um, how do we help the network check for the quality of resources that we're sharing? Um, and how can, how, how can you help the network get the right resources directly to the point of need? Having them out there on the internet in some list isn't good enough. We know that people are stressed and frazzled and, and we need to be able to get them what they need uh, at their fingertips. So that's the, that's the global challenge, right? And we need to do this really at scale at a, as a sector. We need to think differently about this. So I'm delighted to have our panelists here today. And I thought, uh, having had that first half hour, that, that we might start by talking a little bit about um, what your worlds are like and, and how they've changed as a way to feed the group. The group of you, you all, just so to, to be clear, folks, you all in the audience, you're the ones with the answers. We all on the stage here 
we're the ones with the needs and the questions today. Um, just to be crystal clear about who's bringing the wisdom. Uh, with, with nothing against our, my esteemed panelists. But I, um, what I'd love to do um, is talk a little bit, um, uh, uh, Ben and, and, and Aria and Matthew, about how your, how your worlds have changed, right? I mean, we all sort of have an assumption about what's changed but we all work in our own, our own little world. So it's good to step outside of those worlds and hear what's going on elsewhere. So I want, why don't we start with you, Ben? Can you tell us a little bit about um, what are the things you never thought you'd have to worry about pre-COVID that, that you're now dealing with at scale and looking around for help or expertise or knowledge? Um, and what is your team dealing with? Sure, I think I um, probably, so first of all, it's great to be here and it's good to see faces of people that I know already and it's wonderful to reconnect and it's wonderful to meet some new people. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Again, I'm Ben Maddox, I'm at NYU. I'm also based in the New York City campus. Um, you may know that NYU is, uh, has 14 global locations. So I think, um, first of all, the first thing that I, I'm reminded of for all of us is that these are three dimensional discussions, right? This is a, it's happening on the ground. It's happening in people's minds in terms of how to be creative, you know, and it's happening with our hands. We've got to do different things than we have done before and um, instructionally. And uh, so I think it's a really interesting sort of dimensional component. And you add to that the layer of emotion and anxiety and fear and the fact that each of us bring a different perspective. It's just multidimensional. So I think, first of all, I'm amazed at the creativity that people are bringing to problem solving through all those dimensions. And that just, I'm just kind of astounded by that. But there are kind of qu three quick things that I'll mention for, for NYU. So we sort of began watching um, COVID march across the globe starting in late January in Shanghai because our NYU Shanghai campus announced at the end of January that we would be delaying the start of the semester. So for NYU, we sort of watched this across the world and that was a really interesting um, puzzling process at each phase. And I think the first big lesson learned from there is that we underestimated it at each point. Mm -hmm. We made good plans, we operationalized, but we went from Shanghai to Florence, then Abu Dhabi, then the EU, and then the New York and the domestic campuses also in Washington and LA. So for us, we sort of had a chance a little bit to prepare emotionally and operationally, but we just kept underestimating the scale and depth of this crisis. So that was the number one lesson, I think. Um, number two, I know far more about plexiglass and hand sanitizer than I ever thought I would or wanted to. I also never thought that I would have a serious discussion with the president, the provost, and the leadership team about cleaning protocols for bathrooms, um, which we've had. So I think the lesson, second lesson learned is that in a crisis, details matter a lot to different people. Um, and that I think the third thing that I'm learning that I knew already in higher ed, which is that most single responses to big problems are pretty dissatisfying to everyone. So when we say we're going to go fully online, that's dissatisfying. When we say we're going to go fully in person, that's dissatisfying. When we say we're going to go masks everywhere, that's going to be somewhat dissatisfying. And so as leaders and creative thinkers, the third point for me is we're going to have to sort of figure out where the really least horribly dissatisfying things can live and where the good things that come out of that, what are the good things that we can share? And um, the dreaded mixed mode conversation about students in person and online is a tough one, but we're going to learn something from this. I know we're going to learn something. We may learn we never want to do it again, but the third thing is that, so these dissatisfying components, I'm really looking for the rainbow behind the rain on this. Like somewhere here, there's an opportunity to learn and grow, and I think we're going to find it. So those are sort of three things that I've been surprised about that we keep learning at the meta level. All right. Thank you. Um, Matthew, uh, you have a somewhat 
similar, but certainly not identical role uh, to Ben's at a somewhat similar, but certainly not identical institution. Um, and I'm wondering what your, your role from your, um, from, from your perch, what are you seeing? What was, what was surprising to you about needs? And also uh, just kind of beginning to think towards the next step, what are the things that the patterns that you're starting to see that maybe we can start thinking about together in terms of those needs that we are now learning how to anticipate? Sure, thank you very much, Michael, and glad to see you, Ben, and to be on this panel with you, and also to be on a double Duke panel. It really does warm my heart, so everybody else may be a little <laughs> bit infuriated by that, but it is very nice to be with Arya, my uh, faculty member. Um, so um, I, I think one observation that I have, just to build on what Ben said, all of which resonates with us, especially because we have a China campus in Kunshan as well. So we also did the early drill of this in February. But I, I remember still in late February thinking, no, nah, it, you know, it can't happen here. Uh, so I think there was a level of you know, self-deception slash overconfidence that even us who should have known better you know, I, I, I take that on ourselves. I'm not sure we would have done that much differently. And I, I do feel good about the fact that um, we quickly published a case study with Ithaca SNR about what we did in Kunshan that informed what we did in Duke and became the basis for many institutional responses. So to me, that's part of the open source idea that we're gonna talk about on this panel of taking the playbook and quickly sharing it with other institutions is it's a way of using the community as a crisis response and resilience uh, tool um, and instrument. But, but just to try to take the conversation one step further, Michael, to answer your question, one, one observation that I've had is how differential an impact um, this has had on different people, on different institutions. Um, one very simple one is about you know, people who have kids and people who don't have kids. If you have small kids at home, you're exhausted and you're not in any place to do any big type planning and design and all the instructional you know, design conversation about the fall for you is lost slash infuriating and maddening and you don't wanna hear another word about it. But other people are like wildly productive right now and they don't have to teach and you know, they're getting more papers out and it's affecting you know, by gender very differentially and there's already been some research about how submissions to research publications by women are now way down and we've exacerbated some of the gender inequalities that have already you know, been structural inequalities in these fields. Um, I have two small kids, though. I'm seeing it in my own life. So, and I see it on my team as well. And I think the response has been marvelous among, you know, our team and to the extent possible in sharing the burden and kind of building a culture of solidarity among the team and taking it on as a, as a shared challenge. But there's just no getting around the differential aspect of this. And I think we need to design for that and prepare for a faculty, some of whom are going to be very excited by the design challenge and want to, you know, pick up the flag and run with the affordances of the technology and embrace new online designs and others are just totally exhausted and want nothing to see of Zoom ever again. And I think kind of stepping back from that personal experience to think about institutions, you know, one observation that we had early on is that there's this kind of distillation of our missions down to the core learning mission. When you take away residence halls, dining halls, athletics, extracurricular activities, and you just do classes, there is something kind of, um, clarifying about that, it's kind of brings you back to the, to the mission. Um, it's kind of a, like a baptism by fire that we've gone through here. And, you know, we've seen that in the growth of our online courses on Coursera, which are up between three and 500%. There's this extraordinary need for learning right now because it's the lifeline for many people. It's their only connection. It's the thing that's keeping them going. And we've heard this from students too. You know, many of them, for, the, for them, like the, key, the courses were their connection to the outside world when they're incredibly isolated. So they're serving this really important purpose. And I do think, you know, Coursera is, not, is up 300, 500%. Khan Academy is up 300%. All these learning platforms are booming right now. That's something, that's kind of the differential impact in terms of, you know, learning that it's playing a really important role and people need it more than ever. Um, I put out a piece in Inside Higher Ed with my co-author and wife, Emily Levine, about when humanity is under threat, people crave the humanities. And like a lot of that growth actually in these learning platforms is in humanities courses. The number one course mm -hmm. is in, is Laurie Santos's course um, at uh, Yale about um, 
kind of intentional life design. Um, but the, there's also the flip side of that is this massive risk of backlash that I think we face, which is that if we don't do this right, if we overpromise, if we, if we say we're doing more than we actually are doing, I think people may never want to deal with us. May, they may never want to look at a Zoom again. You know, when you spend your whole day doing Zooms, you get Zoom fatigue, as we've learned. It's kind of a new phenomenon that we didn't know existed before. And I think that's something that's, that's you know, if, if we trumpet this too much, if we're too triumphalist about this, I think there is a real risk of backlash. And I think we just need to be honest in terms of what we're promising our colleagues and what we're offering here. And to narrow down, to focus down, to limit the expectations for what we can and can't do for the fall and keep them in line. You know, we've used this term emergency remote teaching in the spring to try to distinguish from real online learning. Online learning is something we do with a team, with instructional design, with a lot of intentionality. Emergency remote teaching was our crisis response. It's what we could kind of cobble together under extraordinary duress, um, given these very, you know, stressful situations that many of our faculty were facing. In the fall, we're using the language of flexible teaching to build in more resilience in case we need to pivot to do you know, like Ben was saying, some courses online, some courses hybrid, mostly kind of mixing and matching, and we, we just need kind of more design. So um, those are some of my observations, Michael, I think, but I think the differential aspect of this and the kind of the, the two sides of the coin and which will prevail, I think is a big question for our sector. Will it be the new focus on learning and we'll be able to keep that distilled mission or will there be this backlash? And I think, what can we do to mitigate the backlash? And I think kind of invest in the learning opportunities and the growth opportunities and the resilience opportunities for ourselves and for our community. That's the opportunity that I think we have as a group, as a collective in, in the Ethereum world. So there was so much in what you just said that's worth unpacking. And I'm, I'm gonna um, eschew my role of unpacker, which is my usual role. That's, that's your role audience. I'm gonna ask a couple of questions off of Matthew's uh, comments that I want you to, to, to think about um, in terms of, because again, this is goal, our goal was to produce action here. We're trying to figure out what we can do together. So Matthew's just, on, and Matthew and, uh, uh, and Ben have just unpacked for us a bunch of challenges. Um, and so one is, even though we have to deal with toilet sanitization, Right, I mean, there's just no getting around that, right? Um, what we want to be focusing on is you're going through this awful experience as a teacher or a student and, uh, or as an administrator. Um, and it, how, how can we put, how can we go through this with you in a way that focuses you on things you can learn about your professional identity and the skills that you can acquire and the ways that we work together that permanently change your view of what you do. So however we come out the other crisis, there is something new, right? And that is a collective endeavor. How can we engage in that endeavor? You know, another is we all see, I, I, I like we to say we're, we have a blind man and the elephant problem and we have to turn this into a blind women and the elephant problem in a kind of Carol Gilligan sense, rather than groping around and saying, um, this is what I'm feeling. Each of us should be groping around and asking, well, what are you feeling? Um, because uh, the problem that Matthew articulated of, hey, you know, we're getting, we're getting fewer women who are publishing because they're at home taking care of the kids right now. Like, one of the definitions of privilege is being able to be ignorant of problems of others, right? I, I remember going through the Me Too season and um, asking all the women who were dear to me in my life, you haven't, you haven't gone through anything like this, have you? And being shocked by un the universal answers that I got back. Right. So is there something that we are there some things we can be doing as a community to scale up our ability to be empathetic and to understand differential impacts? Um, and and I'll, I could go on, but I'm going to leave it at there because I, I want I also want to get to Aria. Um, so Aria, your role is 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 different 
um, uh, than Matthews and Ben's. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about Osprey, if you don't mind, just a, a minute or two explaining to us what it is, um, and then to also answer that question of how the crisis has you thinking differently about what you, uh, what the needs are and what you can be and, and should be doing right now. Sure. So Osprey is open source pedagogy, research and innovation. And um, it's a, a project at Duke where we look at the intersection of open source values and practices, methodologies and um, and critical pedagogies. So and and increasingly, especially over the past year, we've really been implementing design methodologies into that mix. So um, you know, I, I think what we've been doing for the past few years with Osprey is so relevant to what's happening now, not just because of the, the need for resilience and the kind of dedication to really thinking about um, who can contribute to knowledge and to learning and like where does that knowledge happen where does learning happen clearly it's not only in the classroom and and who can participate in that knowledge and some of the kind of larger questions i mean right now i'm as a faculty member who's been like really um amazed at how technology can enable really like critical pedagogy. I've been amazed at like, it's kind of what Matthew said when, you know, oh, certainly Duke won't go completely online. And then it did, you know, almost like <laughs> in about two weeks, it was unbelievable. I mean, I truly never thought something like that could happen. And, and yet now, you know, like, I so appreciate that people are differentiating between things like emergency online learning or emergency remote teaching and flexible learning, because we already see pieces coming out saying, oh, students don't like online learning, online learning doesn't work. Um, and it's because we weren't doing online learning. Um, and so, like, what I would love to see, kind of the work of the, the Resilience Network, is to, to really figure out not just kind of the tool piece, but the pedagogy piece. And this, I mean, this truly is an opportunity where we're confronted, not just with COVID, but with what's happening in the world, you know, the acknowledgement of systemic racism. And, and that's not just that's not just coded into technology, that's coded into classrooms, that's coded into learning. You know, I really, I, I think we have an amazing opportunity to really take a, a good look at that and think how we can do it differently. And no one person, no one institution can do that alone. So it necessitates this kind of resilience network. Um, so that was, I meandered. Um, but hopefully mm. I hit some some points that are relevant. No, I, I actually, you hit one of the most important points, which is that um, COVID is, we feel like it feels unique, but it's not, right? If, if you happen to have the misfortune of living in Puerto Rico when the hurricane hit, this is not a unique, a first time experience to be isolated and have services cut off and have health crises all around you and have your emergency services taxed to the limit. And, um, you know, there are many parts of the world where resilience crises happen all the time. And as we're seeing now with, our, with the, you know, the uprisings and the, the, the issues in our social fabric, they may become more um, common going forward as you know, climate changes and so on and so forth. So one of the questions to ask, and I see some comments uh, about, hey, you know, it's so hard to get faculty in, into the classroom to get training. Well, yeah, because they're, they're demotivated, right? They're, they're given negative incentives a lot of the time, but the world is changing fast now, right? And a lot of those institutions that were, you know, focused on 
well, we've got to get grants in the door. So focus on getting your grants in the door are now focus on, well, we, if we don't get students in the door, we're not going to live to get grants. So get students in the door, right? So how do you do that? Well, you've got to develop, you know, suddenly all, all the, your, all of your differentiation, your differentiators, all of your presence, they're online, right? So how do we do, how do we develop that quickly and how do we close that gap or at least narrow it that, that Matthew was talking about between um, the, you know, how long it takes to ramp up an intentionally designed online course or program and how long it takes to throw up a resilience driven crisis remote learning course. Can we narrow the gap in our processes? Can we become more resilient as institutions? And if so, how do we go about doing that from the positions that you all occupy? How can you begin to rewire the reflexes in your institutions and how can we conspire on that together to make that happen and help drive that ha to happen? Um, I'm gonna ask the, the panelists for one quick uh, round if anybody's got any questions that they wanna uh, jump in um, or comments they wanna jump in on before we go. I believe we're up for brainstorming session next. Um, so if, if, if you, if anyone wants to jump in, you've all said some really interesting things and I'm not, if I were you, I am, well, I am chomping to respond more to each of what, uh, each of you said. So I want to give you each a chance. Let, uh, let's, uh, go in the same order as before. Ben, anything you want to add? Well, I want to throw a couple, two questions out maybe that we can add to. Um, so if anybody knows Michelle Wucker's book, The Gray, the Gray Rhino, you know, you understand the concept of the white rhino, that's something you're surprised to see, or the, you know, a, a different, a pink, a pink rhino. Um, the gray rhino is like, what's the threat that's literally running after you that you're not responding to? So I'm curious to know kind of what's the gray rhino that we're going to learn out of this, which is to Matthew's point, is it that there's great potential for uh, online or blended learning to complement a residential experience in a new and rich way? Um, or is it that, oh my gosh, I never want to see another digital interaction again? So I'm sort of thinking about, I'd love people's input on kind of what's the great gray, what's the gray rhino running, charging toward us? Um, and then the second is kind of, um, how do we get to all feel so special like we all do, even at the department and discipline and school level, when a lot of the practices that we want to share can be common? Um, and so I think the interesting part to me about the networked concept of resilience and information sharing is, um, you know, kind of getting past some of our snowflake tendencies to say, yeah, there really are some shared practices we can do. And I just would love to hear what people think about those things. So I'll stop there. Okay, so how do you, how do you, what's the gray rhino? What's the threat we don't see coming? And how do we create a new sense of um, contribution and professional pride and identity that isn't tied to the resource that we created? Uh, Matthew? So I wanna just offer a few points of hope for this group because there's so many okay. things that are getting us down right now. And I, I worry that I might've contributed to that. Um, but I think we all need things to look forward to. And you know, while, while the silver lining conversation can be a little bit insufferable, I do feel like this is a safe space for me to have that conversation with this group of forward thinkers and um, like-minded colleagues. So you know, one of them to me, I think is about courseware. The second to, to, to me, I think is about like um, learning design. Um, and, um, the, and the third is about taste in ed tech and judgment about learning technology. So on courseware, one thing we've seen is the rise of kind of a shared commons approach to content. Um, it's improvisational, it's resourceful, it's born of this necessity. But for example, Coursera has launched this initiative um, as part of its coronavirus response. And uh, last I checked, um, it's meant for institutions to basically adopt the Coursera library. And last I checked, they had one third of the colleges and universities in the world either reached out to them or had set up something with them. 
um, after two months of having this program up and running. So it's thousands of university colleges and universities in a few months have basically adopted the Coursera courseware library as the basis for their crisis response. So this maybe this is the turning point for courseware and shared content, which has always been a kind of holy grail for our field, but has always seemed one step too far out of reach. Maybe this is the thing that um, turns that corner for us. The second is learning design. I, I think I saw this great tweet from Biji Sati, my colleague at uh, UNC. She was saying, you know, the online format makes pedagogy and design more important. The emissions are more glaring. So when people say, oh, I hate online learning, what they mean is they hate badly designed online learning. And I think there's, there's a potential for saying like, this is good evidence-based approach. This is good active learning. Here's how you do it right. Use the breakout rooms and let engage in that conversation and to really put the focus on good design. Broadly speaking, doesn't matter whether you go back to your face-to-face -face classroom, we'll hopefully be able to retain some of that evidence-based approach. She's an advocate for that in her face-to-face -face classes. And I do think there's a lot of excitement um, and potential um, in, in that model. So to me, you know, I, I hope we can preserve some of this feeling of like um, the potential of the technology. When we sit with faculty now and they say, oh, I want Camtasia, Panopto is not good enough and iMovie is not going to do this. I'm like, well, like you, we've never even met you before. And now you're sitting down with me and you're telling me about like this tool has this feature. This tool, like, that is a fantastic situation, for, honestly, for us to be in. When we have faculty using critical judgment about what Zoom can and can't do and what Panopto, like, they're getting deep in the weeds of the feature set of Sakai and all the tools at Duke on a level of specificity and clarity and judgment and all of that's not going away. There, that level of engagement with our tools and what's good and what's not, both in terms of learning design and the tech, that is a fantastic outcome that has already happened. And I think it's true of our students too. They're sick of some tools, they like others. All that judgment, all that taste, all that is gonna be really good for making better decisions in the future about more empirically driven decisions, if you will, Michael, that are based on actually experimenting with these and seeing what works and what doesn't. And um, that, that lived experience of using these things and trying to get them to do what you do and wrangling them together, all that's gonna be great for building long-term partnerships for offices like ours with faculty who are now much more interested and much more aware and much more knowledgeable. And I think we've, we're cultivating that taste for the long term among our students and our faculty. So those are three sources of optimism for me, the courseware thing, the learning design thing, and the taste that's basically become ubiquitous. And everybody's now got an opinion about what's good ed tech. And I think that's gonna be good for us in the long term. I love the word taste, and I'm gonna allow myself to expound on it just a little bit, in part because I've noticed that um, uh, we have a little bit more time before the next segment than I realized. Um, it feels to me that taste in part helps to encapsulate in an intuitive sense your earlier two points, Matthew, and also uh, uh, speak to, 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 to Ben's, I think, uh, uh, previous uh, point that, you know, taste is, is a way of, in, in some ways of saying that we, we've developed new instincts and sensibilities. Right, some of which are based on, on kind of a tacit, a new tacit understanding. And they also get at, if I have a sense of taste, that's a positive attribute about me, right? That I can share, you know, I, I can create a design and share it with the world, right? But I am the taste maker, right? That's distinct now. The fact that people are copying me uh, in the fashion world makes me, that's a good thing. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. They haven't taken anything away from me. So I think there's a, there's a sense in which, you know, openness and succeeding in openness is about in creating a sense that people can be tastemakers, that they, they, that they can develop a sense of taste about this. They can learn it, they can refine it. Um, they can share it with each other and they can get credit for it. So um, I, that feels like a good transition to you, Aria, uh, and, and your next round of thoughts on, on uh, the conversation so far. Yeah, um, so I 
am usually not optimistic generally, but I'm always optimistic about education for some bizarre reason, which my entire career leads me to believe I should be wrong about, but I continue to be optimistic. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, if we think about courseware, shared content, some of what Matthew was talking about, I mean, this really is the essence of open pedagogy that if we do not, as, as instructors, see ourselves as transmitters of knowledge or information, but as facilitators of learning, I mean, it seems to me that if we really can get that piece right, where so much of the, the process and the time of teaching can go back to what happens in creating new knowledge collaboratively, you know, if we can push some of that content into the shared model, um, that would be a tremendously successful result. And, and I would like to bring it back to the idea of, you know, in open education, there was this and continues to be an unfortunate split between, you know, OER and open pedagogy. Um, and it, I think, feel like what we are are going into which i really want us to push against is what happened with oer when we just digitized text and said this is open education that's not open education that's an extremely important piece of open education but if you continue to teach the same way it's not open um, even if the textbooks cost nothing and um I don't want us to just digitize the way we've been teaching and call that online learning because that won't work either. And I think the OER movement really was, has been like profoundly stunted by not focusing on pedagogy. Um, and so I, you know, I guess kind of my hope and my question is how can we, um, collaborate with each other and with faculty and with students to always make sure we're keeping the teaching at the center of what we do when we create technology solutions. Well, once again, I have a, I'm going to play off of that as a, as a good transition. Um, so you've talked about open as this is a, a building theme. It's not just a product you you that comes out the other side. It's not just the OER, it's not just the software, it's the process and it's the continuous improvement and it's the professional identity associated with your pride of contribution, right? So I'm gonna ask for one more round and, and Lucy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draft you into this round. Um, but let's, uh, let's start with Aria this time. My last question to you before we go into breakouts is, given the conversation we've had so far and the prompt and so on what do you want this group to be thinking about with specific regard to the strengths um, and characteristics of the Aperio community in terms of how this group can contribute to the sector-wide problem which they can interpret as helping each other in the community or we can interpret as broadly as you want well, I guess I would, um, what I would want is for this group to really question why we would create anything that allows people to continue teaching in a way that we know is not, that we now empirically know is not um, really setting them up for success in the world we live in. And, um, you know, I, I think that in order to teach the way, like to really practice open pedagogy, especially if you're doing it online, there has to obviously be a technical piece to that. I mean, there's a technology component to that. And so, you know, the more we can push against just digitizing the way we've been teaching and really think about how can technology how can technology heighten community even when you're not in the same place? You know, how can it heighten engagement when it's asynchronous? Um, to me, that, that's 
always what I'm looking for is like those kinds of tools. So if, if this community can contribute to some of that, I, again, I think that would be a great success. Terrific. I would love that too. Uh, Lucy, I know we've had some conversations um, and you have some thoughts, so please uh, chime in. Yeah, I, well, I would just say uh, thanks for the opportunity. And I would also say that um, I've seen some of this in the chat um, also, which is that I think that we have um, a different culture, many different cultures on campuses. And often our faculty culture is not like our IT culture or not like our learning design culture. And this idea that um, of, of having hashtag and coming to a potluck is really antithetical to the way they are rewarded, um, the way they are cultivated, the way they think of their roles. Um, I think that OER is a great example of this because um, I love the idea of taste that Matthew brought up, but also we've used this idea of taste of like, I could never just use an OER because I do my own special version of R and there are 45 that are taught in my institution, but mine is a very special version and I couldn't just use the OER. I mean, I would always say to people, take my syllabus because you'll never teach it the way I do, right? I don't, I don't care, take everything I'm doing. And I feel like one thing that this, um, this moment has been is a great leveler. Um, people are suddenly so willing to share. We had, um, we had a conference on Friday in um, College of Arts and Sciences at NYU. We had 300 faculty there, 300 people on Zoom for three hours listening to what each other were doing. And that, um, and, and hearing the things that we hear from design and development, hearing this cross-disciplinary, um, uh, concordance of what they could do. So what I would say that this community could do is there are a set of, and this is what I love about what ARIA does, is there are a set of values around and structures around collaboration. Um, and there are a set of practices around how we do it. And I think we can model that and bringing that into our um, faculty communities, um, starting where we are, so that this opening and this possibility doesn't close up. Because the other thing that I'm seeing in the chat is about our students. And a lot of us who do um, student-centered pedagogy have worked on this for a long time, right? It's really, it's another way around the Indiana, jo getting out of the Indiana Jones model of the faculty member is decentering that classroom to where your students are bringing the information in. their students are equal parts of knowledge creators. So that, so that's what I would love to see is how we can take some of our processes and some of our practices from collaborative software building, which I saw a lot of in your videos and how our development teams and our people who have a lot of experience with iteration and being not afraid to fail and not afraid to um, change in midstream can do some of the training that I've also seen in the chat that people would like to do. So, yes, I have thoughts. Thank you, Lucy. And I, I want to call everyone's attention to the billboard behind your virtual background there, that the next big thing will be a lot of small things. I think that's very true. Um, so I think it's only fair that we alternate NYU and Duke here just to do the sort of, you know, institutional fairness. So we got to go to you next, Matthew. Uh, what would you like to charge this group with? I, I charge this group with figuring out a new model for a Purio project incubation. Let's find a way to channel all of this creative energy, the new taste that we're seeing among faculty or the distaste that they have for the existing tools that we have and turn that into a creative problem solving opportunity and maybe even a social entrepreneurial opportunity for some of our faculty who want to take a leave and do a meeting and kind of take a page from the Chuck severances of the world, the people who've really embraced this idea of like using open source as an expression of my value system, my open source academic value system, which privileges sharing, it privileges collaboration, peer review, all these things that are true to who we are, are also great ways of doing innovation and in education technology. And I feel like there's now this mismatch between the venture back model of ed tech, which is very fast and very robust, but it produces these tools that do not fully express our values, do not fully express like what we're trying to do in classrooms, like Aria was saying, like the 
true expression of me as an educator is never going to be fully expressed by something that was built by a 22 year old venture backed startup in the Valley. I love those tools and I use them and we license them, but they're not going to be sufficient for us. And Sakai, while it's good and we use it and embrace it is also a little stale. And I think it's not an expression of today's learning challenges. So let's pick up this mantle of the, you know, the, the dissatisfaction with the existing tool set, the need for more digital tools, the faculty who are now basically activated and realize how critical this infrastructure is for our you know, long-term institutional health. It's become so strategic. What tools you have now has become key to the success of your institution and your ability to differentiate. That's all wonderful, fertile grounds for doing more incubation of projects. And you know, we've got a few going at Duke. We want to do more of them, but I think as a community challenge, let's figure out how to support our colleagues in becoming the next Sakai, the next you know, OE, whatever it is, whatever it is you see in your world that needs fixing, that needs some technical entrepreneurial project you know, solution, let's pick that up and run with it. Michael. Michael, I think you're still on mute if you're responding. There we go. Thank you. I was just going to say that is a great charge. And having seen recent pictures of, uh, of, of Chuck Severance uh, preparing his car for, I don't know what, demolition derby, his Sakai car. Um, uh, I think the idea of, uh, of our learning technology is being so embedded in our, our, our self-expression that it is an extension. It's it's like our lecture notes. It's it it feels deeply personal to us. Like how can we how can we bottle that? How can we enable that? How can we make that possible? That's a great charge. Ben, bring us home. Well, listen. You know um, what uh, what NYU loves to do is take advantage of opportunities to convene people. So I think it seems like. Um, what would be really exciting, and we've had uh, a number of folks who are on this call come visit us in New York, including Matthew and others, and sort of convened opportunities. And it seems like out of those 300 people that we, the 300 faculty members that we had at CAS um, last Friday, and we had 100 faculty on a virtual teaching conversation across Abu Dhabi and New York and Shanghai about a week and a half ago. And we're having dozens and dozens of really interesting, lively conversations, which are posted on NYU's website, by the way, and they're available, those recordings. Great conversations with energized instructors of all flavors across our institution. I would charge us to bring those together. I mean, can't five or six or four or eight or 12, um, but a few early adopters who are energized about where this change can take us positively. I think it's important to broaden the conversation to include educational technologists, innovators, instructors, organizations, and functions like Osprey. And I would, I would suggest that we continue to broaden the conversation here and bring in some of our really continue to bring in some of our really energized instructors and faculty and fortify the conversation with their interests that would be my next step you know i'm i think normally i would uh you know uh, matthew teases me that my old southern baptist roots come out and i would order a big thing of punch and get some cookies and put them in the fellowship hall but i think we're going to have to have a zoom call um first, but I'd love to broaden this conversation to include some of these energized faculty voices from our institutions. We are all members of multiple networks. Um, and oddly, uh, I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of my time feel like I'm drift, feeling like I'm drifting from one world into a completely different world. Um, and so I think this idea that Ben is suggesting of bring a friend who's not part of the network, but probably should be uh, to the conversation. This is a great idea. So um, let's talk about how this next um, segment, the last segment of our afternoon, but not the last segment of this work uh, is going to go. Um, if I understand correctly, we have a bit less than 10 minutes to get people reorganized 
into breakout sessions. And then you're all going to brainstorm uh, on what you all can be doing together. Um, do we have a, a Google Doc or are they using the, the thread in the Sakai forum or how are we doing this, the Lucy and Jolie? We do have a Google Doc and I will put that in the, um, a link in the chat. Just give me a second here to retrieve that. All right. I got it. It's there. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All and right. uh, everybody click on that link right now. Do not lose <laughs> that link. And I think we're going to lose Ben. I think Ben's got to go. Yeah. Um, we appreciate your time. I'm really yes, sorry to miss so the much, brainstorming, but I will benefit from it afterwards. I'll follow up with Lucy and with Michael. And thank you again for the time. And I just want to wish everybody a safe rest of summer and a peaceful rest of summer. And um, I know it's going to be a hardworking one, but I'm just sending my very best to folks and these colleagues and this great valued community. So thanks for having me today. Thank, thank you, Ben. Thanks, thank you, safe, Ben. Safe summer. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Okay. Um, so uh, Matthew may need ben, to drop off as well. I don't know. Matthew, are you going to stick around? I'm going to try to stay for a bit. Okay, uh, great. Yeah. Okay. So how are we all going to get notified? Are you going to make your mat do your magic shuffle while we wait here? Is that how that works? Yeah, what we're going to do is someone, I'm not a, I'm not a co-host, so I won't do it, but someone will okay. um, automatically put us into breakout rooms. And what we would like for people to do is to begin to attack the questions, um, which are on the top of the Google, which are also in the Google Doc. Um, and we're going, oh, look at that, I became a co-host. You complain and <laughs> so, and ah. there you go. I wasn't complaining, by the way. Uh, I was just saying I wasn't going to do it. Um, so we're going to make, we're going to put everyone to breakout rooms. The Google doc has the questions in it. You should um, grab a group number. I don't think we have any way of assigning group numbers because we're going to go random with the assignments from zoom. And, um, I, and I want to say a couple of things. Um, we've got a lot of stuff in the chat, which is really good. We had some materials also that were posted to the Sakai forum. All of this will be rolled together. One goal from gathering this together is to begin to draft something that um, we can make into a more actionable document representing our community. So, um, so make sure that you're also, I'm seeing also happening in the chat, um, people saying, but wait, you know, we're overwhelmed. We can't focus on any of these things or here are the things we really need to focus on. So also reflect that because I think that that reality of where there are a lot of people in this community who are stretched very thin right now. And, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. So reflecting that also. So I think we're ready. And then um, I think how, how long, Jolie, in the groups are we going to come, we're going to come back for, to, to share back out about four o'clock? That sounds great. Um, yes. Okay, great. So um, the breakout room power, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not um, seeing it either, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, the primary host who is okay. Oh, oh, who Julie. is that? <laughs> Julie, I think it's oh, you. Oh, now, now I am. Now I'm the primary host. The okay. Uber host. It's like the <laughs> hand of God is like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, down. and so we are gonna have. Um, yes, we're gonna do eight rooms because that's how many sections we have on our sheet. Yep. Um, and. Um, so if someone would make sure whomever is in your room, we have some moderators who'll get kind of um, distributed around, but since we're doing automatic, we'll, we'll need you all to sort of um, jump in and engage with the doc and make sure your group's notes are being recorded. So everybody can do that. And I guess we'll see you all around four o'clock. Great. All right. Here we go. All right. Okay. Open all rooms.
Okay, those folks that are left, um, did you did you see your breakout and just chose not to join, or do you want to just stay here in the main room with me? I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and share the discussion prompts in case anyone here wants to chat with me in the main area. Not sure if I understood this correctly. I went to my breakout room and I was the only one there. <laughs> Sorry, Ron, that happened um, to others as well. I, I, I got there. There was one other person and then he left. I was like, hmm, should I be staying in this room or not? <laughs> Sorry, Ron. <laughs> Maybe this is a subtle hint for me here. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, all right, so I'm going to put you in seven with Harold. Okay, cool. Thank you. Am I, am I still waiting for this tran transfer here? Um, you should have gotten a prompt that said to, to join. Um, let me see here. I'm a, I'm a Zoom guy all, and ISU pretty heavily. And I didn't see a prompt. Hold on here. Maybe it's in my background. Yeah, because it's showing me that you are in breakout room, but you haven't joined yet. Okay. Um, no, I do not see a all right, here's what, here's my suggestion. Here's my experience. <laughs> I'm this so happens, sorry here. I'm seeing, I've seen this happen before. And I'm log out and yeah. then log back in. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay, let me do that. Okay, thank you. Sure.
Hey, Julie. Yes. Can you move the folks in room six to room four? There's only sure. two in each of those rooms. All right, got it. Should be Charles and Terry and Chris and. So as long as they're and they're okay, they know we're doing this. Yeah, I've talked to both of them. Awesome. Just sent, just made the move. All right. So hopefully the group of four will have better luck. Okay. Okay, I guess I'm not having good luck here. I'm in this breakout session with you, Jolie. You're so, I'm in the, you're the I've completely answer. logged off. I completely logged in. No, no, it's cool. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna try to put you with Harold again. Okay, we're Bye. trying it again. Crossing my fingers. Oh, there we go. I Yay. see it now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So folks who might be left in this main room, um, and if you've just chosen not to jump into a breakout, I am going to float around the breakout rooms for a little bit. I just wanted to give you a heads up and uh, I will be back shortly.
we've all curated. The, it gets back to the problem. Of, oh, wow, that was harsh. Hi, everyone. Hey, is that everyone? I'm trying to see if everyone's back. Yeah, we lost about half of our breakout group, so it looks like other people may have lost. Okay. Theirs. Not in the transporter beam, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but just the pattern buffer. They're still in the buffer. <laughs> <laughs> They're stuck. They're not coming back. Yeah, that sort of happened when we did the um, distribution. We had folks who didn't join the room, or maybe they couldn't join a room, and this just happens. You know, Zoom is, as we discovered, Zoom is not perfect. I also saw a bunch of folks from kind of my time zone and beyond where yeah. you know, it's, like it's 9 p.m. where I am, it's 10 p.m. in South Africa, and we had 33 African participants in the conference. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm unsurprised they didn't all make it to the end. Yes, I'm glad that they made it at all this afternoon. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad absolutely. they could be here to be at least part of the conversation, and I totally understand. So what would be terrific is if we had um, someone kind of report out from each of the breakout rooms, just sort of, a, I, I know we all like had things that we wanted to talk about, ideas maybe that we latched on to, um, but just a report out about what happened, what happened in the discussion. I don't think anyone was in breakout room one, is that correct? All right, I'm not saying anyone say, oh wait. Um, breakout room two, anyone from that room wanna step up and and speak up about what happened there, what the discussion was like. We had a nice discussion. I'm happy <laughs> okay. to, to share that. Thank you, Alan, for stepping up <laughs> and just to, to let us know. That's good. Um, but I mean, there's so many layers to this, right? I'm, I'm coming in from an instructional perspective and then I was properly, you know, reminded, hey, you know, what if somebody wants to know how are people taking temperature, you know, to approve, you know, X, Y, and, you know, and there's so many administrative facilities, uh, student success elements, uh, you know, it does become overwhelming at that point, thinking about all of the different aspects. Sure. Um, it's really multifaceted. Right, right. Um, and are we working or engaging with the right stakeholders as well? And can we rely on those stakeholders to effectively communicate to their communities? You know, um, if, if in speaking with a dean or associate dean, will those individuals actually pass and ask questions and move on to their own communities or as busy individuals, would it fall off of their radar? Um, or should we be speaking with somebody else who you know, is, you know, works with those groups, et cetera, to, to, to do that? We also work into like, you know, there's the facility folks that may be responsible for this and yet what they're doing may impact classrooms and our teachers involved. Um, and how, how can we, how can we collectively say, hey, stop reinventing the wheel across every institution around the globe. Um, we're all facing pretty much the same kind of things. We have different flavors, but how can we, uh, do as the prompts and as this notion is, how, how can we share this and where would we share this and who could be involved in the categorization as mentioned? Uh, can we get librarians involved to figure out their meta wonder and tag everything appropriately? And, and can we get QA groups together to assess like the quality of that? And is there a score or a rubric or other kinds of facilities? And how do we promote things that even even if something is publicly posted on the web, doesn't necessarily mean that it's Creative Commons. So how can we promote the, the sharing in that space? So anyway, we had, we had a lovely conversation. So I won't go on any further, but. Sounds um, great. And, yeah. and the others can certainly correct me if, if I've missed anything. Okay, well, no one's jumping in yet. So I'm gonna move on to breakout room three, if that's okay. Anyone can I just very, very yeah, Michael, quickly interject. This is, I totally understand the feeling that I'm, I'm getting from that group and I, I empathize. I mean, we're all feeling this sense of 
oh my goodness, this is so big and how are we going to get everyone on board? And what about the toilets? And, you know, you, you just, and we can't solve, we personally can't solve it all. So the whole idea of the network is ignore the, not ignore, but set aside the 99 problems that you can't solve and focus on the one that you think you might be able to, right? And figure out and be as creative as you possibly can about, you know, try to remove as many constraints from your thinking as you possibly can about that one thing and find the one thing you can contribute. And it is a potluck like that. So I don't know how to cook a dessert. I, you know, if I got a signed dessert, I'd be in trouble. Fortunately, I can make a salad. So make a salad. Love it. Okay, breakout room three. Who wants to report out from breakout room three? Or who would like to? I'm happy to if no one Thanks, else Maria. wants to. Okay, um, so we started the conversation kind of brainstorming around the idea that it's actually not even necessarily more resources that are needed, but a kind of synthesized um, essential resources um, kind of um, series of like documents or something. So um, just kind of, I, I mean, I think it's echoing what people are saying in terms of people are overwhelmed. There's so much to look at every day. It feels like it's new circumstances. And so, you know, how can that be really like scaled down? And, and um, then we start talking about the templates and, and the default templates on Sakai. And um, I guess, and Tiffany, please correct me if I get this wrong, but it sounds like, so UVA has a site builder. Um, and so faculty can kind of, choose between like the very few um, features all the way up to like a pretty advanced site with a lot of features and that that you know can work really well and is one way to let faculty align the technology with their pedagogy and so we kind of talked about this need to like align those two things and how can we leverage technology so that it heightens our pedagogy. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about Sakai, so that's as far as we got. That's okay. okay. All right, fantastic. Breakout room four. Anyone from that room like to report out? Yeah, I can talk about it a little bit. And so we were we were talking about how um, you know we mentioned there's some training videos that that faculty could create that could be shared out you know use of a specific solution. Uh, we talked about how um, you know going more conceptually we could do like webinars or discussions like with partner institutions or other institutions just to share information and concerns. Um, talking about it, you know, people that have gone through this, right? Like. Uh, NYC or Duke, you know, you, you folks knew what was coming. And so if that would have been able to be out somewhere, or maybe it was out somewhere and people just didn't know where to look to be able to say, this is what we're going to have to uh, deal with <laughs> in two months. So let's start looking at it now. Right. And to be able to talk through that checklist with someone that's been there um, and then just kind of have that thought leadership. Um, we talked about how, while the strategy or the needs are going to be, you know, there might be similar needs, there's going to be a lot of different solutions out there because not everyone uses the same LMS or the same CMS or, you know, the same video conferencing. Um, so it's, it is important to have those templated sites, um, but it also needs to be able to, we need to be able to uh, share resources in terms of the strategy versus the solution, if that makes sense. Um, and then we started talking about, you know, a solution to, to the next couple of questions where it was, how do you, how do you help the network categorize those resources? And so that, that is a solution. There needs to be something, you know, a site you go to or whatnot 
Um, and the very, very basic is a simple spreadsheet, but you know that that clearly lacks some things. And we 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 um, kind of ran out the time talking about curation and how do we handle curation, right? Is it community based? And we didn't have the answers. It's just we brought up some questions, some interesting thoughts on you know, is it kind of like Wikipedia where anyone can curate, but then you have some people that go in and and kind of monitor, or do you have the universities that want to um, join in this, this collaborative distributed curation, uh, assign people inside of their institutions that they know uh, really understands like biology, and so they curate bio, biology content, um, but then that added the, you know, that has a problem because now you're putting an extra strain on the res on universities instead of here's something I can just go and reach out to. Um, so we kind of ended on that. Didn't really have a solution, but that's kind of where our, our thoughts were. Great. Good discussion. I would say to Chris's, to Chris's point, um, at NYU, we absolutely, we saw this coming. We were supporting um, Shanghai, we were supporting Florence, and we went to Indiana. Indiana University has this amazing site. I put it in the chat, and they had already thought of everything and, um, and the reasons that you would do this. And so we just were like, we had started to reinvent the wheel. We're like, we're stopping. We're not reinventing the wheel, to, to Michael's point. This, this is a great checklist. We're going to just go with this, and we're going to, and then we tried to, our office tried to offer for the other offices, look, we already did this. You do this, and then do the thing that you're good at, your two screen situation you got to do for the dental school or whatever you've got to do, and we'll benefit from that. So I think exactly what you're saying is right. Yeah, Duke did something similar. We borrowed from Indiana and Stanford. It's on the on the footer of our website that we were um, we borrowed from their from their sites. So we did not totally reinvent the wheel, even though we had experienced um, you know our support of DKU, which is our our China campus. Um, this it happened there first. That's what started this whole process for us. Is all of those faculty came back to the states, and we were helping them, but. You know, it's like 600 students. It's a small, you know, just starting out university um, with seven week semesters. It's very different. Um, it was a very different scenario than, than trying to apply what we learned to Duke. It was still kind of a heavy lift. But great. Um, breakout room five. Anyone can report out? That's Lucy and Ian and Michael. Yeah, that was a, that was a weird room. Um, I just put the link to <laughs> felt strange. Um, Michael, jump in. I, we had a really interesting conversation about the role of um, Aperio's incubation um, program uh, and the ability to promote um, promote uh, the things that our community does well, which is a, a vertical stack of um, understanding student and faculty needs, being able to provide student and faculty testers and feedback on software, um, and, and being able to provide that as incubation to push it out into the world. Um, so there were, um, there was some conversation around that, um, as well as conversation about, um, so we, there are a couple of use cases about how Duke um, did this with Warpwire um, how, you know, GitHub seems to be an open place or that's very attractive, but it's actually not. And that would, um, you can share things, but it's not an open space. It doesn't have open source um, practices within it and how you could actually um, turn that around and look there for projects that would be good for our community. Um, and we finally um, s finished talking about the Hathi Trust, which um, started out as a Google funded project that was quite controversial in academia. Um, I remember 10 or 12 years ago when it was first starting out that um, Michigan was digitizing all of these texts and um, a lot of libraries refused to participate and there were all of these, you know, like copyright issues and what happened to the library and all this stuff and they just plowed ahead and Hathi Trust saved so many schools because it had 40,000 digitized texts ready and they were suddenly just released. Um, and so the set of practices that, you know, some, because I think a lot of us that work in open source here a lot of the time, this is not practical, you can't do this. Um, 
you know, this is not, it, mm -hmm. it works against academic values. And this is a great example of how it saved the day. So Michael, did I miss anything? I know Ian, this had to go because it's like late at night there. Yeah, the only thing I would add is um, that uh, as with the content resources, where people are frantically, even people who know about all the great resources that are online, are finding themselves frantically creating new resources because of the specifics of the situation. That's probably true in software too, that there are probably integrations and, and bits of, of functionality that are having to be created on the fly because nobody's ever had to deal with this particular residential problem before, for example. And that that's going to continue to evolve over time. And so one great service would be for Apirio to be a place to collect those projects um, and encourage people to share code and recognize that there's someone down the road who's developing something different or something similar rather. And number one, to be able to have them pool their resources and energy um, so they're not reinventing that wheel. But number two, so that we can get a better sense of how needs are changing over time, which are largely invisible to us right now. Great. Breakout room seven. Jolie, can I just oh. say super quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to like open source, and I, I understand, I guess this is to Lucy's point, open source values are so not antithetical to like academic pursuit. I, ju I just like, I don't understand that. I know people say that and anything we can do to counter that and smash it it just it's it's the exact opposite of like what it means to create knowledge in the world i think i think you're so right and i think that actually technology has opened that up um i think that you know in the days when there could be one author um you know that um that that was you had to compete for that but i think now people are more open to um you know a wiki to a google doc to um acknowledging multiple contributions i think the problem is tenure and the problem is um promotion is for originality um and so it is a it is just a system that kind of i, I remember once um Oh, 12 or 13 years ago, a colleague said, wouldn't it be so cool if you could see all of the different searches that other people had put in this database and a group of faculty were collectively horrified. They were like, no, then someone will know about my topic. Um, and, and so like, and then, and then I won't be Indiana Jones. And I think that, that um, I think that that's where some of that comes from. But we need to look at the reality that the majority of our campuses now are not tenure track faculty. They are adjuncts and many of them really want help and need help. And actually we offer them templates and sharing and collaboration so that they come up to speed faster. So I think you're exactly right. And I think the real reality of the faculty that most of us work with is quite different. Um, but there is that mindset, totally agree with you. We also talk about um, tenure criteria as if they're carved in stone tablets. But the truth of the matter is faculty committees make up tenure criteria, right? Mm -hmm. Administrators make up tenure criteria. They can change them. And right now, those tenure criteria are not working in the interest of institutional survival in the time of COVID. I agree with you, absolutely. And I feel like if there's anything that we can do to I mean, that's how things would truly change is if we change tenure. I mean, that really, and it's actually a very, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do culturally, but process wise, it's not nearly as hard as some of the other ways we're trying to like think of saving, you know, education, so. Yeah, I would say that's true, but I would also say, and maybe we've just seen this more at NYU, um, in the absence of the protection of tenure, many of our adjuncts and, and graduate students have become unionized, which is just as difficult to work with, you know, of people whose contracts say, I will not start planning my course or anything until my, I receive my letter, which is the day before classes start, right? And so, um, 
you know, and then um, universities that support that with collective bargaining agreements to say, okay, fine, but we will not give you university authentication until that time. So you can't use library resources. You can't get, um, you can't log into um, the learning management system. You can't take a class. Um, I mean, we're already seeing this, like COVID is like, COVID makes all class divisions worse, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we have like people who are like, well, you know, it's not my union contract. I'm not gonna do that because once I start giving you whatever, okay, fine, but then, you know, we're also not gonna give you a computer. Like just this back, just this antagonistic back and forth. So I think it's true, but I think unfortunately one institution and the protections have bred the need for other protections. So this is not like saying that these are bad or anything. I'm just saying that for people who are on the ground trying to get the teaching and learning prioritized, it could be very hard <laughs> to work against these systems. And one of the gatekeeper systems for enforcing these work, work roles is giving people access or not access to technology. Um, and as Heather is a, a saying over in the chat, the people who suffer are the students, right? Like we're gonna gatekeep on the students. So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, breakout room seven. Harold, Ron? Okay, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start now. And if Harold, our breakout room was uh, quite small and it's, it's uh, um, let me show my presence here so you guys get to see the COVID-19 pandemic response look for Ron McGetrick here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so our group was quite uh, different than other groups. Um, you know, actually, I thank you for all, even the comments people were making before. Um, I'm not a professor at Illinois State University where I work, and Harold is also not a professor. He's, both of us are on the IT side of the house, both as Sakai administrators. So it's, it's, it's a, this has been a good uh, comments for all these groups because I can see we have people on the phone that are professors. We have people on some groups that are in leadership. And we have some people on the IT side. So we all have different perspectives. I think with our group, it, it turned out to be really good because uh, Harold's University is uh, a different kind of layout than our university. His university is about 3,000 enrollment. As he said, he doesn't have resident student, actually students uh, living on campus. We're in our university, we are a university of 25,000 um, and we have, you know, tons of students on residence. So that difference in our group, I think helped with coming up with some, I don't know if they're common ideas, but at least we saw it more from a technical side. So one of the things in the first question that we uh, Keaton, and I know a lot of people have already discussed this, is uh, both our universities have produced uh, user guides, a lot of how-to guides, you know, for example, the professors that were just talking, you know, with when you give someone a computer and all that, well, in our worlds, in the IT world, we're the people that have to support you, and so therefore our universities did a lot of work around technical guides, Zoom guides to basically take the technology and make it easy for the professors to make their jobs easier at the end of the day. Another thing that our universities have done is outside of uh, working with a Sakai, like in my role, because um, even the Longside people that I work with uh, at Longside, they know this, I not only support Sakai, but I also support two other LMS systems at our university. And so we've actually had some uh, vendors at our university that um, wanted to provide uh, training videos on like COVID-19 techniques like washing your hands, face covering. And like if you go to our university, it's publicly accessible so anybody can actually watch them. One of the things that our university is doing surely is we're requiring uh, everybody in the university actually to watch these videos so everybody can probably be trained on how to wear their mask. What is the, what is the definition of six feet apart? What is the definition of, of uh, you know, uh, um, face coverings and that stuff? So that was question number one. Question number two was, how do you categorize those resources and route them to the right people? Um, I, I think Harold came up with some really good ideas. He had mentioned at his university, um, there was a lot of coordination through emails from, from the IT side of the house, all the way up to professors to the, the president of their university. Um, we also talked about catal cataloging these findings. As you know, most of the people on the phone that are professors when you're dealing with your IT shops, 
Uh, we store them a lot of times in databases or applications so you can quickly find the published work. Another thing that we talked about uh, that we've been heavily using, his university's uh, been really liking Zoom. Our university uh, heavily uses Microsoft Teams. So uh, for example, just the, uh, actually about two days ago at our university, we, I mentioned we are requiring people to uh, watch these videos. Well, we are currently working with the vendor to eventually post that out on our website. And we had a mass uh, Microsoft Teams meeting, kind of like the Zoom meeting with leaders on the phone to kind of collaborate as a, one group on ideas on how to work with the vendor. Um, our third question is how can you help the network check the quality of the resources being shared? So for us, this is kind of common ground, definitely in the IT world. In the IT world, because our job is not only to support you, but to safeguard the data for the university, to safeguard the integrity of it. So we look at the quality, we look at how things are out of date and, and wrong. Uh, at our university, what I thought was very impressive with our university leadership, I said we're at about 25,000, is our president our university formed committees uh, when we did our pandemic response. And so to give you an idea of Illinois State, Illinois State currently has about 3,000 faculty staff. I know we have some universities on this call that are much bigger than us, but 3,000 is a pretty good size. And believe it or not, uh, for our pandemic response, Illinois State actually formed over 100 committees as simple as like they had a committee on parking. They had a committee of like, okay, when we return students, how are we gonna wash all the bathrooms? And so literally there were committees made up of like sub segments of things they needed to carry. They made recommendations, which in turn was given over to the university for publication for like a, like a, a book that a lot of universities have made. One thing that Harold pointed out that I thought was really good was he said that we need to come up with a rating of any information we contribute. So for the professors of Luago that were talking about a tenure with their professors and how tenure could be an issue. Um, what we were suggesting maybe from the IT shop is that there may be some university out there should build some sort of tool where when you put uh, contributions in that the community as a whole are a uh, review thing. Like one of the things that I like doing on a regular basis with the Sakai community, uh, which you'll see me ever so often post, is I like to post uh, questions to the community in our listservs. And I usually will ask people very openly and candidly, what do you want? And tell us your honest truth, because what I'm really wanting is a review system to know, like when we make a decision, like with a vendor or like an LTI tool, like what other universities think. So Harold agreed with that. And we, we think that a good rating or review system would be a thing. Our final question was, how can you help the network get appropriate resources to the point use of time? Uh, this one, we were kind of running out of time. So this is a shout out we'd like to say, because we do know uh, long sites on the call with us, both Harold's University as well as our university, we are long site partners. And we, th we think when we have scaled up, long site's done a fabulous job. So what we think is a strong partnership with whoever, whoever is your host vendor or vendors that you're working with, like if you're working with like Respondus or you're working with uh, uh, like uh, Sengage, I know someone mentioned they work for Sengage MindTap. Um, so if you have partners that are supporting you technically, having a good partnership relationship already in place would help, especially when you have to respond fast. The other thing we thought, and I, this came from Harold, and I thought this was excellent. Harold suggested a contingency plan, kind of like the military does. You know, when we think about, we turn on CNN right now, uh, our president of the university or United States is talking about contingency plans, working with our military, standard operating procedures. Well, that those really good ideas should also fall with our university. We should have, I mean, like everyone has said on this call, we've learned a lot of things already. Let's document that and let's put those into uh, uh, operating procedures. So if this happens, say in the winter, even worse, then we're all better prepared. So that's pretty much our answers. Thanks, Ron. Okay, breakout room eight, we're kind of running out of time. So um, I'm, don't, I'm not trying to rush anybody, but I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Sure, I can share that quickly. Um, so we had a couple of general points just we talked a bit kind of starting at the bottom of our document, um, just about needs of our students and instructors and how to some extent we do have a lot of 
materials already. So it's also that our instructors really just need support and need kind of simple uh, answers and strategies. Um, in addition, uh, just a general suggestion that they take a Coursera course or some other online course to become familiar. Um, some questions around students and you know how can we train them in online learning and also uh, find ways to get feedback from them um, and whether, for example, there could be surveys developed that anyone could use to kind of either specifically address how students are doing in this situation or more generally in a learning experience. Um, also just kind of asking about, you know, how do we measure student engagement and teach instructors to do this as well as encourage it. Uh, we listed a number of resources that we have or we've heard of. Um, and we were wondering if, you know, we could ask for volunteers to help with review, um, although everyone seems a bit overwhelmed. Um, there was also the comment that uh, a lot of, since we have so much information, how do we know what information is actually needed versus we already have plenty of people give it? Because that's kind of my concern. I, I could write a novel on online courses, but I don't think anyone else needs it because there's already some novels. Um, but so could we also identify where we actually need more information. Uh, we talked specifically about the need for other ways to collaborate or discuss our experiences. It could be more with certain tools um, or certain strategies and having some kind of wider network for discussing them. Uh, and then uh, in terms of like kind of a site or solution to sharing this information. Um, I was mentioning that Merlot and OER Commons is kind of a similar type of thing that we might want, um, but that it has to be really easy to search and tag. Um, and uh, in, in particular, uh, we talk, Wilma talk, mentioned that Open Aquella might be a good possible tool to use. Great. Michael, I'm gonna turn it over to you to wrap it up. Any final quest thoughts or summaries or? Yeah, this is fantastic uh, uh, work, folks. I'm really, really excited about the, the creativity and the thoughtfulness. And I, I, I just want to emphasize to you that this is just a start. Um, and I say that with a lot of uh, hesitance and compassion because I know the idea of starting something else right now on top of everything else you're dealing with is probably somewhere between daunting and infuriating. Um, but uh, I, 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 what I wanna encourage you to think about is, uh, um, especially as you're in the middle of one of your other daunting and infuriating tasks, um, think about, well, what if we could do this? What, I know that there are, I've got colleagues who are struggling with this too. This thing I'm struggling with right now in my institution, my problem, what if, what if we could do this differently? What if we could help each other? What would that look like? How can, how can we do that? How can we, um, what's the cre most creative thing I can think of? And don't always come to the answer of, well, it means we have to put together a committee and do some curation and all of that. That's always the, the kind of um, default academic answer. We need to be agile. We need to be creative. We have so many creative people who come up with so many brilliant ideas, except when it comes to how we perform as organizations on a daily basis. For some reason, we, we shut down to the brainstem when, whenever that happens, we get to those conversations. Awaken, reawaken your higher functions. When you are in a position where you're saying to yourself, it really can't be this way, it shouldn't be this way. Take that a step further, ask yourself, how can it be different? And bring that back to this group. Um, my goal is to have a convening um, in the fall, a virtual convening, uh, that will include inputs from a number of groups like Aperio. And I'm really hoping, I'm really excited to hear what ideas percolate as you take some time to think about the conversations you've had and they sit with you as you go through your daily grind um, and come back together and, and, and talk as you do. Um, uh, brainstorm a little bit, you know, 
uh, in that shower time, in that why am I here time, in that sitting on your hands waiting for something important to happen time, um, and see if we can come up with a better way of doing things because we need it and we're smart enough to figure it out. Um, thank you for uh, indulging in this experiment with me. Um, I didn't know if it was going to work, frankly. It worked far better than I had hoped, and that's all down to you. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Aria. Thank you to Avatar Ghosts of Ben and Matthew, who <laughs> had to go away, and to Jolie, who's an amazing partnership um, in, in doing this. And I, I, I thought when we started working on this with Michael that this could be an amazing um, cross team, uh, cross institutional view, and the notes look really rich. I'm so excited. This is gonna continue. Um, you can still add information. The notes document is going to stay open. We can link to it. The forum will continue to stay open. Um, and we will, Julie and I will work on this and harvest it. Anybody else who wants to join us in this work, just ping us. Um, because I think that it's going to be a really important conversation. Um, and the unique piece that we can bring to this um, maybe is not all of the links and all the things, but what the open source values are, what the um, project collaboration and contribution values are that we, that we have brought. So, yay, great. See you guys Thank tomorrow. You. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Take care everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.